in honor and appreciation for Sam and the other speakers and moderators that we have on the program today, rather than a, a token gift, a coffee mug or something else, what we're doing at the Burnham Moore Center is making a donation in the name of each individual speaker and moderator to a program called the SEED Project on Campus, which is a graduate school class primarily that identifies, renovates, and rebuilds a a home of a needy family or individual in the Linda Vista neighborhood, which is right near the USD campus. And uh, they try to do it on time and on budget. And as most of you in anywhere near development know that as the students get into it and they find out they tear out a wall and they made their budget and then the plumbing is no good and the electricity is no good, suddenly they're screaming for more money and they're ha holding bake sales to raise more money. So it's a great project and they always need cash. So we thought the best thing we could do to honor and thank our speakers was to make a donation to that program each time we have speakers throughout the year. So we'll be doing that. Uh, Sam always does a great job. He gives us a roadmap and a lot to think about. But we also have a, a very strong program now to follow. Uh, I tried to structure today's program to be as forward-looking as possible to avoid some of the rearview mirror monkey driving that Sam was talking about. Uh, everybody is struggling in one way or another to try to seek their own advantage in this particular challenging market and they're trying to figure out what are the new rules, what are the new markets, and what are the new behaviors that we're going to have to follow in order to uh, survive and get over some of these challenges uh, until healthy markets are restored. Uh, when we take in our new Master of Science in Real Estate degree students, most of them want to become developers. Uh, after hearing Sam, I am again uh, pleased that our program is not strictly development oriented. It is much more broadly based than that because some of the programs that are strictly development oriented will be producing students over the next five years that, if Sam is right, will have no jobs to go to. So we're happy not to be doing that. At this point, I'd like to invite Kent Griffin and his panelists to come up on the stage. And please remember all the uh, moderators and speakers' bios are in your printed program. Thank you, Mark. It is an honor uh, on behalf of Biomed to be able to participate in this program and to continue to support uh, the excellent work of the Burnham Moores Center for Real Estate. And so we're happy to be here today. We've got a, a distinguished group of panelists and industry thought leaders that I think will be informative and, and, and interesting to hear from on the heels of Sam's comments. But before we begin, I want to get, give our panelists uh, an opportunity to better understand the audience here and the sentiment. Um, as I looked at the, at the agenda and the title for this session, uh, The Shape of Things to Come, it occurred to me that it, it, it sounds like a movie title. And it sounds like a movie title that could be any kind of movie. And so I'd like, by a show of hands, this won't be as scientific as the, uh, as the electronic uh, answers, but I'd like to get a show of hands of, for those of you who've come to this session, to get a sense of 2010, what kind of movie do you think you've come to? Is the, is the shape of things to come a feel-good story, a Disney movie with a happy, happy ending? We're all going to live happily ever after. How many of you came, come thinking that 2010 is a Disney movie, the shape of things to come? It's not very encouraging. How many of you think that 2010 and the shape of things to come is going to be a long, drawn-out, thoughtful, character-building, uh, the kind of movie that I would probably fall asleep in. How many of you think that's what 2010 is going to look like? That sounds like a really exciting year. And how many of you think that 2010 is, is a, a drama, thriller, uh, the eye of the needle genre for, for some, some folks, or the Born Identity crowd? Uh, how many of you think that we're going to be another roller coaster ride a la 07 and 08? Handful of folks. How many of you think that uh, the shape of things to come is this really scary horror flick and that we're all going to be macheted by the regulators and the lenders? Well, that's encouraging. That's a little better than last year. So I think that gives you some sense of where the audience is. Um, the, uh, the panelists that we have today, we're, we're actually, we've got two representatives from the lending world, and then Brian from what I would call the transactional investment world. 
And I think that's appropriate because, uh, because it really does start, you know, the first, second, and third steps here are the health and recoverability and, and the access to capital from the credit markets. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then uh, turn, turn it over to them with a few sort of leading questions. I'm going to start with introducing uh, Chip Fidelin, who's Executive Vice President, uh, Group Head of Real Estate uh, Banking Group at Wells Fargo. We're fortunate he's up just up the coast here in Southern California. I'm personally pleased to have had the opportunity to work with uh, Chip and his colleagues in the past. And as many of you know, Wells Fargo, as an institution, uh, has a history and a reputation of very disciplined, thoughtful underwriting, which, uh, which prepared them very well for this most recent uh, economic downturn and positioned them to be one of the uh, strong surviving institutions uh, coming out of it. And so it's obviously very uh, important to, to get Chip's commentary. Jim Riley, next to, next to Chip, is uh, Executive Director of the Syndicated Corporate and Project Real Estate Bank Lending, actually now in Chicago. I've, I had the good fortune of working with Jim uh, together when we were both in New York uh, with J.P. Morgan a number of years ago. And likewise, J.P. Morgan is another of the strong financial institutions that was well positioned and well prepared to uh, navigate the financial crisis and really, was really one of the uh, institutions that helped lead us, out of, lead us through and out of uh, the crisis, at least as far as we've made it to date. And then the, our, our third panelist, Brian Stofers, is the president of CBRE Capital Markets, uh, dealing with both debt and equity uh, based in Houston. Uh, I think his commentary will be particularly relevant because he's focused on the transactional world, the uh, investment sales and financing transactions, which I think are most relevant uh, to a lot of us who, who live and die by what's going on at the transactional level. So to start with, for, for Chip and to Jim, I have, I have three general questions that I'd like, like to ask them to comment on. Uh, the first relates to credit availability, which is question number one. Is it expanding? Is it contracting? Or is it simply redistributing between the haves and the have-nots? The second question is, how is underwriting changing both now and as we progress into 2010? Are we at the new normal or are we still evolving? And then the third question, we have seen improvement in the bond markets, and we've also seen some early signs of life in the CMBS market. And will this market, particularly the CMBS market, come back in sufficient size and scale to, to address the issues that we have in front of us? And if, if it does come back in whatever form it does, how will it be different from the CMBS market that we've, we've known over the years? And the related question on the rating agencies, how will they evolve and change uh, related uh, in relationship to how they've worked in the past. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, perhaps to Chip first, if you want to comment on uh, your perspective. Well, good morning. Um, I was really encouraged when I got here this morning and I saw this very vibrant con uh, uh, conference with uh, goodie bags and uh, all kinds of great colors. And uh, then I realized I was in the wrong room. I was in the medical devices <laughs> sales <laughs> conference. And so, I'm really pleased to be back in the more somber real estate environment. But uh, in all seriousness, when you look out at the conference and you think that this is the best attended conference that, uh, that uh, Dr. Reedy has had, um, I think it is somewhat indicative of what's going on in the credit markets. And that is, is um, as Mr. Zell said, you know, there was really sheer panic uh, you know, 18 months ago, uh, 17 months ago. And I really do think that we've come a tremendous distance since then. And frankly, the credit markets, at least as I see them, reflect that. Um, we really uh, uh, went from a uh, position as an industry of capital preservation to now, um, I just got back from a senior manager meeting uh, up in uh, San Francisco for the bank. And um, similar to a lot of our REIT clients, as Kent can attest to, uh, the talk is no more about the right-hand side of the balance sheet. It's about the left hand. It's how am I going to grow my asset base? How am I going to make money? Not how am I going to preserve capital? So I think just in general, and I'd be interested in Jim's viewpoint, um, I think things are not only better in the capital markets, I think they're a lot better. Um, I'm not sure, though, that that translates over, uh, again, as uh, Sam Zell was talking about, relative to sheer real estate metrics, but it certainly is probably a leading indicator. Yeah, to, uh, to uh, echo uh, Chip's comments, um, 
It is great to be here. The last time I was in San Diego speaking was at a NARI conference in November of 2008. That was really somber. Uh, REIT stocks were up and down 10, 15 percent. Um, you know, two of the, the REIT, um, uh, the NARI board of directors um, were leaving their posts um, as uh, leaders of their, um, you know, very well respected public companies. Uh, and so we, we all recognize that we've, we've come a long way, uh, but it also reflects uh, the fact that we've been in this you know, credit crisis driven uh, environment for over two and a half years. You know, this started when, HS, when um, Household Finance uh, announced a massive asset write down due to subperformance in their subprime portfolio, um, and that was in the summer of 2007. So here we are two and a half years later. It sure feels much better. Uh, the capital markets really have rebounded incredibly. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with public companies um, and public companies in the real estate sector have, have, have had unfettered access to the public equity markets, the public bond market, and now the, the mortgage market really for the better part of, of nine months. Unfortunately, the bank market is quite dislocated from the capital markets. Um, bond investors, uh, equity uh, funds are seeing inflows of capital. Bank capital still is, is under pressure, and while that pressure has been substantially alleviated because the banks too have been able to raise significant amounts of capital, um, you know, 50 billion, uh, you know, for the larger banks like J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, but many of the other U.S. regionals have accessed very significant amounts of equity capital to reinforce their capital. But banks still have significant drags from legacy portfolios, um, and they face a very significant amount of regulatory and policy-making uncertainty with regard to capital requirements, the activities that they can be engaged in, um, and additional taxes and levies, which ultimately do uh, take money out of the capital kitty and pass it on uh, to uh, the government or, uh, or other regulatory agencies to help you know, buttress some of their reserves. So the capital markets, as it relates to the public companies, has been a great boon. Um, unfortunately, uh, the banks lag and they will continue to lag, but um, certainly we have seen over the last six months, a lot of banks, both domestic and foreign, uh, step up to the marketplace, recognize that commercial real estate um, and residential real estate um, is still a good business for well-capitalized sponsors. Uh, unfortunately, everyone looks for the same thing, whether you're a public equity investor, uh, a bond investor, or um, a bank. You're looking for modestly leveraged, broadly diversified, um, and, um, and basically end game survivors. Um, and to Mr. Zell's comment, not everyone fits that bill today. Um, and so obviously the sweet spot for uh, capital today as it relates to the public companies uh, reflects the fact that the model has proved to be resilient. Um, it's transparent, it's diversified, and much more modestly levered than many of their, uh, their private company um, cousins in the marketplace. Yeah, Brian, if, well, I was going to say, Brian, hearing those comments, could you give us your perspective? Because you're on the ground on the transaction side, and you're starting to, as I understand it, see some volume of activity, maybe a little better than six months ago or nine months ago. Are, can you give us a little thought on, I know Sam talked a lot about where we've been, but where are we right now? Sure. And then where are we going? Well, we're, we're thawing, but we're certainly in need of more heat. Um, debt capital is coming back uh, frankly, stronger than we expected. And likewise, equity capital is building, but they're all focused on the same asset types uh, or the same quality levels. And so for those assets that are in gateway cities, prime assets, core assets, type A assets, um, there are multiple bids. As Sam suggested uh, on the EQR, or EQR portfolio, 40 bids. Um, we're selling loan portfolios with hundreds of, of uh, comfies being requested. So there is a lot of equity out there, which I think is, is driving the, the pricing 
up and the caps down, but it's on a very, very selected basis. So uh, compared to how we felt last year, we're feeling a lot better this year, but I don't think anybody um, that we speak with are forecasting a, a, a gangbuster year, but a modestly uh, better year. I, I, I used to say that it's hard to fall out of bed when you're sleeping on the floor. Well, we're sleeping on the floor, and I think we're about ready to wake up here. Yeah. Take, I guess one perspective would be, you know, Sam alluded to uh, developers and contractors potentially going back to med school. If you didn't want to go back to med school, but had a clean slate from where you try to position yourself uh, in, in the real estate, commercial real estate arena today, knowing what you know, where would you want to start from beginning in 2010? Open it up to... Well, I think you start with asset management and, and fine-tuning the operations of, of your properties. And we're seeing a lot of focus on tenant retention and, and uh, upgrading the assets to, to keep the tenants that are, are there. And, and I think that's probably where a lot of uh, focus is going today. Yeah. And from an asset class perspective, is there a, a favorite ap asset class that you would focus on? Well, you, you follow the money, right? So GSEs uh, have got uh, almost an unlimited source of funds for multifamily. So I think multifamily is still going to be the, the, uh, the prime asset type from the broadest perspective. But if you look at uh, some of the foreign interest in America, they're really looking at, at office and the, and the core office product that has a good rent roll. Yeah. Uh, Chip or Jim, could, could one of you comment perhaps on from a private developer's perspective, we talked a lot about the, the, public, uh, the public owner's perspective in the REIT world, which gets a lot of attention, but a lot of folks don't have the luxury of, of that capital source. Where do you think, see things evolving for the private, private owner, operator, developer? Yeah, let me, let me tackle that. Um, you know, it's interesting, as Jim mentioned, uh, the, the REIT model really has proven to be a very resilient one, and it's, it's really resilient because of that access to the capital markets. And so by definition, the private developer doesn't really have that access. And I think that that's really going to be a differentiating factor. It already has been relative to um, being able to put your balance sheet in order to take advantage of the opportunities that will be out there. And so probably, um, probably, what will happen, and, and again, I don't have any, uh, any uh, clearer crystal ball than many others uh, who are in the industry, but it'll probably be a sort of a modified repeat of what happened in the early 90s, where some of the private guys who are larger um, may actually end up going public in one form or another. But before that can happen, um, we've got to get out of the asset valuation model and really transition over to a little more of a platform valuation model because if it's just on asset valuation and they're just an aggregator of assets and, and again, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Zell referred to earlier, um, where there's not a lot of equity there, then there really isn't a lot of lift and there isn't a lot of access to that capital that's going to do the private developer any good. But I'm pretty optimistic because if you think about it, um, you know, real estate is still, in most segments, a pretty local business. And the defining factor of a good private developer is, you know, they're generally very competent. I mean, the survivors now, not just the arbitragers that came into the business because, you know, uh, it was a superheated market. But good, competent private developers are usually very, very good at what they do. And it is not a crisis of capital. There is a ton of capital out there. And so if the private developer can marry up with the capital source and prove the value add, then that's another way, I think, that the private developer space can recapitalize, put the balance sheet in order, and take advantage of what's going to be, I think, uh, a market that is going to present some clear winners and losers, but some very attractive opportunities. So if, is, if there's capital out there, which it sounds like we're all in agreement there is, and as Sam alluded to, there's not a lot of motivation for the underwater equity owner to make transactions happen. It's, it would seem that it's incumbent upon the banks to facilitate the transaction process moving along and, and, and you know, stopping, stop pretending and extending and actually push, push some of these assets out to market. Is that going to happen? Do you see that happening? You know, it, it certainly uh, has happened. Um, it, it hasn't happened with the same the same volume and the same, um, or the, ex the expected level 
much the same that cap rates haven't uh, haven't uh, blown out, um, and you know distressed opportunities haven't become abundant, um, largely because the banks haven't had to. Um, even the FDIC is they've taken over, you know the the 150 plus you know failed banking institutions across the country. Um, the FDIC isn't necessarily looking to fire sale. Uh, they're looking to partner with uh, with private equity. Um, they're looking they're looking to uh, to help mitigate uh, some of and, and return to the taxpayers, uh, you know, as much as they can, as soon as they can. But they're not necessarily looking to fire sale uh, portfolios, where the current view is that perhaps uh, you know valuation doesn't reflect or current valuation doesn't reflect you know full value, um, and so we don't see banks that do have significant commercial real estate portfolios, um, including our own, uh, you know, between J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and many of the other large banks, we are the largest participants in the commercial real estate lending arena. Um, and while we do have portfolio uh, challenges, uh, we, we don't see um, an imperative to wholesale portfolios today. Um, we are selling and we're selling tactically. We're looking for value for shareholders. Um, and so you will continue to see properties um, and, and notes get sold in the marketplace. Uh, but I don't, I don't think you're going to see a tsunami of, uh, of banks uh, putting property um, and or you know, distressed loans in, in, the, in the markets unless it makes sense from an economic standpoint. The capital that was, you know, so constrained, um, and the and the the pressure on banks to move problem loans is still there. But the capital cushions that all of the major banks have developed gives them, you know, more runway to manage the process over time. I agree with that. We're seeing evidence of that, but I I really wonder if some of this isn't uh, an earnings management situation too. It, it seems to me that that um, at least with the larger banks, they're in a position to um, book earnings and then take hits, if you will. And so it's being done in a very measured way versus uh, all at once. And with respect to the FDIC, I, I, I suspect that with the number of small banks that are likely to fail this year, they're doing the same thing there. They're, they're parsing it out over the span of a year or two in order to uh, stop that tsunami in its tracks, if you will. Would you say that's on point or you think that's distorted there's, there's certainly some some capital yeah. management that goes into the the process um, and you know, let's face it LIBOR at, at basically nothing um, and a steep yield curve does create um, a very very um, positive environment generally uh, for banks to the extent that they have low funding costs on the deposit side um, and can earn you know good returns relatively speaking um, on the asset side um, and so you do have the ability to uh, effectively write off problems over a longer period of time if you have the yield curve positioned as it is. Um, that being said, you know, none of us are in the kind of earnings management game uh, you know, for life because if you have problems, the problems have to be resolved at some point in time. Um, and, and so you're going to take um, you know, a view of, gee, this really, this asset doesn't have any opportunity to to um, to reach market value, or it is it is distressed to the point that the human capital that is applied um, to manage it is not worth the financial capital that it saves in terms of incurring losses. And generally speaking, uh, the re the reserve uh, process in terms of loan loss reserves, write downs, and whatnot is something that's scrutinized very carefully by the regulators, um, you know, by uh, accountants, um, and by boards of directors. And so, uh, you know, I don't really view it as a kind of an earnings management issue necessarily. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, earnings management obviously has some bad connotations. But, you know, let's face it, the whole world's on the installment plan. And, you know, the banks are no different. The real estate industry is no different as well. And I'd like to come back to an example. You know, Sam talked about, you know, he talked about the office building that was bought at $100 million, let's just say, and it had an $80 million loan. And today he said, you know, let's just stipulate it's worth $70 million. 
And then there's a lot of talk about the pretend and extend and the banks sort of kicking the can down the road. But you know, at the risk of, of, of getting uh, uh, lost in the minutia, let me just give you the quick math. So the quick math is, let's just say it's an eight and a half cap rate environment. I don't know whether it's a seven cap or, or a nine cap, but if you just say that, so if it's worth 70 million at an eight and a half cap, that means it's generating $6 million of NOI, okay? And if the debt is 80 million, so there's no equity according to Sam, so the debt is 80 million, and let's say it's fairly priced at 350 over LIBOR, you know? So let's just say it's a 4% coupon, okay? That's $3.2 million. So here you got something that's generating six, you're paying 3.2, there's $2.8 million of net cash flow after equity. Well, you know what? That's not 100% loan to value. If those metrics are true, if you cap 2.8 million, it's like uh, 30, 33 million dollars. So something is out of whack. Right now, it's clearly the interest rate environment, okay? And that's able to be manipulated on the short end by the Fed, and in one way, the Fed is putting us all in the installment plan by allowing these kind of metrics, because if you then turn around and say, let's suppose those values are accurate, you wait for three and a half years, and guess what? There's equity now, if you're able to take that cash flow and amortize down the debt. And I think that that's sort of a microcosm, really, of what's going on. Um, you know, people talk about inflating your way out. In a certain sense, it's analogous to doing that. So, you know, to me, um, you know, if interest rates stay low, the problem will be mitigated or abated. If interest rates go up, then I think, we, you know, especially if they go up rac rapidly, and if they go up two or 300 basis points, then this math completely falls apart. That's when the commercial situation could in fact mimic the residential situation. But that's not lost on the policymakers. So I think, you know, to the extent that we're able to control the interest rate environment, and, you know, I'm not an economist. I don't know whether we can do that over a uh, mid to long term or not, but, but that's the basic math. So it sounds like as long as the congressional leaders, uh, maybe that's the wrong phrase, but um, so long as LIBOR can be controlled, we can stay in this movie that's slowly developing and, and somewhat boring, but if somehow LIB, we can't control LIBOR and LIBOR accelerates, we might have the slashers coming out and... I think you have to. Right. Yeah, the, the hope is that... Um, or reflects the fact that the economy actually is, uh, is stabilized, uh, there is job growth, um, and the, the Fed doesn't have to prop up uh, the economy uh, via low rates uh, to, to help you know, the math that, that Chip just went through. The, the bigger concern, because um, obviously if the economy starts to rebound, NOI should, should stabilize and or grow, occupancy should grow, we should see rental rates start to tick up, uh, and so you normalize the whole sector, if you will. If interest rates rise because of inflation, um, and inflation uh, is accompanied by you know, stagnant or negative uh, growth, that would def definitely destroy the math because you would have both um, high interest rates and, uh, and anemic uh, and probably falling NOI. And, and that would be, uh, and that's what most people uh, you know, fear most is the, the worst of both worlds rather than the best of both worlds. We've also talked a little bit about the, the populism and the, the ability for government to get involved. And, and as Sam alluded to, the, the rules seem to be changing. Are you feeling that or sensing that in your day-to-day -day transactional opportunity or in the way the banks and the, and the, and the groups that you're working with? Are you sensing that this, there's this um, inability to understand the, the rules of the game? I think that that's a valid fear, um, and it might pertain most to the GSEs, you know, Freddie and Fannie. I think there is a fear out there that um, if there's a move made that significantly impacts, and we all acknowledge they're going to be changing over the next 24 to 48 months, but if there's something that changes the, the metrics quicker or, or more dramatically, that could certainly have an impact on multifamily pricing, because arguably the rates now on multifamily through those GSEs are anywhere from 50 to 75 basis points, maybe more um, under what other competitors might be charging for those, those loans. So there is an impact uh, being felt, and, and it's interesting, we're seeing it from the foreign investors more than the domestic investors. 
Uh, they're looking at it perhaps from a different vantage point, different optics, and we've heard it raised more than once, where what happens to multifamily values of our, our portfolios in the states if that GSE impact is changed? Uh, With respect to foreign investors, there's been some sentiment that there's this wall of capital out there, and that's always been sort of stated and asserted, and oftentimes it's been alluded to that it's a lot of foreign capital. But in this environment, with the dollar weakening and this, the, the, the signal that that means in terms of lack of confidence in the U.S., are, are foreign buyers redirecting their, their investments domestically to their own domestic opportunities and taking capital away from the United States? We're seeing it go in all directions. America's on sale because of the value of the dollar, so I think uh, there's a, a a good portion of foreign investors that are, are looking at opportunities now, primarily in the gateway cities, uh, but we're seeing them come from South Korea, we're seeing them in Japan, uh, we're seeing them in China, uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, so, and, and the Germans, the, the German open-ended funds are raising lot, lots of capital that has to be deployed relatively quickly, so thus uh, you're, you're seeing some Germans now most recently in Washington, D.C., facing incredible prices. We were involved in a transaction uh, in September, it was over $800 a foot at a 6.3 cap, but it, it checked all the boxes. It was um, core asset, lead certified, 15-year lease, uh, great location, and the Germans, uh, this particular cost of fund was you know, under 5%, and it traded at a 6.3 cap rate. So that, that's uh, the kind of capital, I think, that's having a, a positive impact on pricing. And so I think that, and Sam alluded to this a little bit, that it's likely that we'll have positive surprises this year because of that wall of capital, uh, more likely than we'll have negative surprises. Yeah. So if, yeah. if I could just make a comment with respect to, uh, to the foreign banks. Uh, you, you talk about uh, available of availability of bank capital. Well, over the last 10 years, uh, German banks, uh, Irish banks, English banks, other Western European and Asian banks have become very, very active here with uh, you know, bankers on the ground in your, your key gateway cities. Uh, what's different about this credit crisis as compared to the late 80s and early 90s is that it's not just a U.S. real estate um, supply-driven issue. It's a global credit crisis which impacts every sector. And so uh, the Irish banks have been largely nationalized. Many of the German banks have been nationalized. And so they are not, uh, they're, they're pulling, um, you know, back. They're, they're having to repatriate capital, and they're, tr they're having to rebuild capital in their own home countries. Um, and so that has a, a significant impact on credit availability uh, for our sector, um, as well as other sectors where the foreign banks were, were quite active. Uh, we do see... Um, in the last three to six months, however, many of the foreign banks that have dedicated real estate platforms um, you know, here and abroad become more constructive, um, but it's obviously on different terms. Their, their bite size in terms of what they will commit on a particular deal is, is smaller, um, but it follows the same constructive behavior that we're seeing from, from the U.S. banks. Um, you know, there are a number of Chinese banks that, that have come into the marketplace because they do have excess capital, um, and they look at returns that they can earn here in the U.S. Um, on solid, um, you know, low beta, you know, uh, institutional real estate, um, and it's much more favorable than what they might be able to earn back in their home country. And so you see some net, uh, net inflows of capital uh, from institutions uh, that are in a positive capital position, the Canadians and the Australians um, as well. Um, you know, notwithstanding the the, um, the policymakers' view that big, big banks are bad, there, there are only seven banks in uh, in Canada, um, and there are probably the same number in Australia. Uh, they have weathered the storm quite well, and are quite constructive. Um, with the best sponsors, with the kind of, of collateral and the kind of, of credit structure uh, that are available in the market today. Yeah. And I, th I think that the foreign landscape has changed. Uh, it's changed a lot. You know, uh, uh, um, as Brian was mentioning, uh, you know, three or four years ago uh, on the East Coast, particularly in some of the 24-7 areas, uh, Manhattan in particular, um, the Irish buyer, that was the, you know, the, the pound, it's, you know, uh, two to one and everything else. Um, you know, the German private syndicator, the open-ended fund was very hot, but 
Um, you know, the Irish thing, I think, is obvious that, uh, that that's gone away for problems that, uh, that they have in their own country. On the German side, there were very heavy, heavy investors in commercial. And as we've talked about, the, um, the magnitude of the decline in residential compared to com commercial, um, you know, there's no comparison. But we all know that there is some amount of mark to market that's going to come on the commercial side. So I think the German syndication thing is pretty unique. Um, I would bet that it's going to get hit, and it's going to get hit hard. Um, and when that happens, there'll be a real uh, awakening over there, that, uh, and it'll be a lot more difficult for those German syndicators to raise money if that happens. But on the flip side, um, you've got the big sovereign wealth funds that, that sort of began to flex their muscle, but I think really are the ones who are going to flow in. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's China, it's Singapore, um, it could be the big Canadian pension funds. Um, but really, the, the, the more winners in this sort of global recessionary environment, uh, they are absolutely flush with capital. And I don't think we've really felt the full effect. So I, I look to them as being a big uh, sort of macro source of, of foreign capital. Um, but on the banking side, uh, and, and uh, I think as Jim said, I mean, there's, there's some real big changes there. But I think we forget, because we're not that mindful of what goes on in some of those countries, but they are every bit as capable of being populist-oriented as we are. And I think that the banks are the likely target. And if you're sitting over there in Germany, and you're paying taxes, and uh, the bank uh, is nationalized, and there's excesses that come out, um, they'll pull their horns in. And I think that uh, there'll be a few players, but the players that we saw in the past, I think it's going to be a while before they come back. Why don't we go ahead and open it up for questions? We actually we have microphones. I believe that they're at uh, tables 35 and 38. Uh, for those of, for those who have the microphones, can you raise your hand so people can can see them? Okay. So there's microphones there and there. So if if you could make your way to the microphone, or if you're close enough, you want to you know shout your question to me. I can uh, I can uh, restate it for the for the group. I guess before we get to the questions, one, one last question I'd like to ask. Each of you has a fairly broad national uh, scope of responsibilities, but most of the, lot, much of the audience here is focused more locally, either in California generally or, or in the San Diego or Southern California area. Any perspective on how the San Diego market might be different from the broader market in terms of opportunities or risks? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I left San Diego, as some of you know, in 1997 and moved to Texas. And at the time, people thought I was absolutely crazy. And so did my wife for a while. Um, but the, the national perspective of, of not so much specifically San Diego, San Diego always has this charmed um, association to it. Uh, but to California in general, is pretty negative. Uh, and I, I think you read about it uh, here, I'm sure, all the time. But, but I think it is you know, something big in the minds of a lot of uh, national investors that California has to get its fiscal house in order, uh, its educational house in order, in order to, to be back up there on the, the top of the list. Um, by no means is it, is it viewed uh, with disdain. I think there's a very big resilience factor to San Diego and to California in general. But I do think that it's lost some of that um, aura, if you will, of being the the uh, the place to invest when comparing it to other cities or other states. Yeah, does that, does that, does that translate to the lender perspective as well? well yeah, I mean, I guess to, to echo that, um, you know, if Phoenix is such a great place, how come they all have houses in San Diego? Um, but I do think that you know, Cal so California has a has a tremendous amount going for itself. Um, in and of itself, we're our own market you know, if we could get our act together. But I think it's just as Brian said, um, we are completely dysfunctional politically. Um, we're a drunken sailor fiscally. And until we can get that house in order, um, because it really does all come back to jobs, and then it not only comes back to jobs, but it comes back to jobs that provide the income levels that can shop in the type of retail centers that we want, that can buy the type of houses that we want, that can rent the type of apartments we want. So, um, you know, somehow, some way, and I wish I had the answer, uh, we do have to get our political house in order. Um, but I think uh, other than that, it's still an incredibly vibrant place. Um, there is an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, there is uh, ample opportunity. And it's just we're our own worst enemy. 
I, I would echo uh, Brian and, and Chip's comments and, and just note that um, you, you're not the only um, the only state, and uh, San Diego certainly isn't the only city that has fiscal issues. Uh, but there are states like Texas uh, that are positioned quite differently. Um, and so you look at the Austin area for technology, for you know some of the high end. Um, you know, uh, real value added industries, and, and there is an awful lot of competition. Every city and every state is trying to spur economic development. And to the extent that the, the fiscal woes um, continue to weigh down um, California and, and other states um, like California, it certainly creates an incredible competitive advantage for those states uh, that have managed their, their, fiscal, um, their fiscal house quite differently. Questions from the audience? Funny jokes, sad stories, happy stories. So, so the question, let me paraphrase for, for, for the rest of the audience. The question, I believe, was we've alluded to the state's financial issues and potentially regulatory issues, but more specifically, the city's financial woes, how much are those affecting investor and or lender perspectives on the opportunity for San Diego? You, you think, about, uh, think about job growth. Um, think about uh, you know, growth in industrial office, um, what have you, it's all tied to jobs. Uh, when, an, when another city in another state uh, can bid more competitively for major plants for company expansions um, and, and companies that are looking um, at a number of different areas, um, that has a direct impact um, on the existing tenant base um, on the commercial side. Um, and obviously, to the extent that talent leaves um, an area, there's a brain drain from one area to the next because another municipality could be significantly more competitive. Uh, that, that has a real direct impact um, on the, we'll call it the fiscal haves versus the fiscal have-nots. Because every company is looking at what kind of incentives, incentives can I get from the state? What kind of incentives can I get from the city in order to expand my, my business or to relocate my business? Um, and let's face it, the demographics of this country are quite uh, attractive relative to those in Japan and much of Western Europe. So there is an awful lot of focus amongst companies across the globe um, on establishing a, a toehold in this, in this market. And many of them are looking quite opportunistically, given some of the problems of some of the industry leaders that are domiciled here in, the, in this country. Uh, but the ability to compete uh, and provide incentives um, is, is certainly you know, a meaningful differentiator as you look at new job creation. So, so the question was about value-added equity investment, and I think the question was, is that capital willing to go to emerging markets, Brazil, Mexico, and elsewhere? I, mean, I think the answer is uh, very fact-specific and fund-specific, but, but my sense is that other than the biggest funds, the answer is no. Um, generally speaking, when, when, uh, when these funds are raised and when the fund concept is sold to an investor, they're, they're, they're fairly narrowly drawn. And so you could have a broad-based fund uh, that says they're going to invest in opportunistic real estate, and they might select three or four different product types. But it's rare, it's been my experience, it's very rare that you'd have a fund that would, uh, that would start out, let's say, with a domestic orientation that would then go to uh, someplace like Brazil or to Mexico. Now, I think the larger funds are different because I think uh, uh, just by definition, um, you know, they have broader charters. But most of these funds that are out there, you know, are anywhere from, you know, 
25 million on the extreme low side, you know, to about 200, 250 million dollars on an equity basis. And, and my experience anyway, and Jim would have an interesting viewpoint too, and, and Brian, but my experience is that, that they'll generally have a box. That box generally won't be multinational until you get to a bigger, a bigger fund platform. From the, from the public company perspective, there are uh, quite a number of uh, industrial and retail REITs that operate uh, north of the border in Canada and certainly in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, the public companies aren't really looking to grow because their cost of capital is still um, you know, too volatile and they're still very much focused on uh, maximizing occupancy, man asset managing and portfolio managing the existing book before they expand. Um, but I haven't seen any of the public companies that have made significant forays um, both north and south of the border uh, come out strategically and say we are exiting. Uh, so they're still focused on the opportunities because the growth is there, uh, but their, their capital right now is more inwardly focused. Brian, your, your take? Um, and not so much recently, but last year we saw a number of uh, pension providers actually give back money that they couldn't deploy in some of these opportunity funds or reduce the size of their raise. So I don't see them going uh, cross-border unless that's in their charter to begin with. Additional questions? So the question was, uh, the CMBS market that uh, Sam alluded to is coming back. I've seen some signs of that as well. Uh, so I think the question is, is that true? Is it coming back? And where are the investors coming from for the different pieces of the capital stack? I'll start that, and I know Chip and Brian have a comment. First of all, let's call it CMBS light, because it's not 90% advance rates. It's not um, you know, super highly structured with B notes and you know, all kinds of financial engineering. It's pretty straightforward uh, product. Uh, JP Morgan and others are actually warehousing conduit loans again. Um, and deals have been done. A large deal was done for DDR. A large deal was done for Inland before the, the end of the year. Uh, and so it reflects the fact that all of the capital markets as it relates to real estate are starting um, to heal themselves. Uh, who's buying the paper? Um, largely, um, you know, real estate dedicated relative value investors uh, who can buy unsecured bonds. They can buy uh, REIT bonds, corporate bonds, and they just look at relative value um, and to the extent that they can see uh, a reasonable return based upon their own risk-adjusted capital, uh, they're going to invest in low beta, modestly levered, um, you know, good product uh, with a good sponsor. Again, you, you have this phenomenon where on the debt side, all the, of the, the, uh, the lenders that are looking to uh, put money to work are looking for the same thing. Quality sponsorship, modest leverage, low beta cash flow, there's a lot of money available for that. And those, those rates have gone from the mid eights to the mid sixes very quickly because there's not much product. Um, at what point will the product, um, the secured offerings expand into higher risk, higher return? You know, unclear, but everyone who is a dedicated real estate investor on the debt side has a legacy portfolio and remembers what happened when they went beyond a leverage tolerance, tolerance went beyond their band of confidence with respect to, to cash flow, coverage, sponsorship, and product type. I would add, and I think, I think uh, Jim's view is, is similar to uh, uh, a lot of ours, but the only thing I would add, you know, when you think about CMBS, the, the, the great thing to me about CMBS is that it places um, in the hands of the person who values that risk the most, it places that tranche of debt there. So in other words, if you like being in a super safe position, um, you can buy the triple A's. If you like being in a little more of a risky position, you know, you can buy the, the, the double B's or, you know, whatever. And so, so the net effect of that should be that it brings down the overall price because as a whole loan, uh, player, you're forced to take, let's say, a little more risk at the top than you'd want to, and maybe you didn't want to have as much 
of the super safe. So the blended, the thought of CMBS really is, is that when you combine all the prices of that capital stack on a net basis, it'll be a more efficient price than the whole loan. That's sort of the basic. Um, and I think all of that holds true. I think it still holds true. And I think that that's the advantage. The but that I have is my own view, and it may not be correct, is that this market will not return to vibrancy in CMBS until the servicer situation is resolved. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems in these pools. And because of uh, a lack of clarity as to how the rules will play out, until that double B bondholder can really understand and therefore price what risk he or she's taking by holding those bonds um, relative to what happens if you have to foreclose, et cetera. Until there's clarity there, I don't think you can get to the price efficiency. So I don't think that's going to stop the market from coming back. But I don't think it'll get back to its true vibrancy until all those rules are clarified. For one more question. So let me just repeat the question for everyone. The, uh, the question was, how long will it take to get back to the 2007 levels of CMBS? And uh, I, would, I would add that, is that a possibility? But, um, and the other question is, what kind of reforms, structural reforms or legislative reforms, what kind of reforms would be necessary or will happen along the way as the CMBS market evolves? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief because I know we're running out of time here. First off, I don't know in our careers we'll ever see that kind of level again. Um, in 2007, the total originated uh, mortgage market was over a half a trillion dollars, and well over 240 billion of that was CMBS. So it's a huge number. By comparison, last year there were only 90 billion dollars in originations. So you think about it, last year less than half of what was just done in the CMBS market alone was done in the entire market among all different lender types. So uh, I, I don't know that, that we'll see that kind of number in the foreseeable or even distant future. Um, but what kind of reforms are going to need to take place? I think you're going to see originators going forward in the new, new CMBS or the CMBS light will have to keep a piece of that on their books for the life of the loan. And that might also solve that special servicer issue when the originator lives with that loan for the life of the loan, almost in a balance sheet format. Now, there's complications to that. The other big reform I think that needs to take place is the whole idea of rating agencies. Sam talked about this a little bit. Think about it. The rating agencies were being paid by the issuers, not by the buyers. Um, so that, that whole idea, I think, has to be reshaped in order for it to come back in a real vibrant form.